giving his uh, reasons to believe in a uh, young earth. Subsequent to that article, uh, several professors, three to be exact, here on the campus, uh, wrote an article to counter uh, Daniel's uh, presentation. Uh, not to be uh, left without the last word, Daniel wrote a second article and challenged the professors to a debate and asked Dr. J. Wild to come for the debate. The professors declined, but we thought it would be a good idea to have Dr. Wild come anyway. In fact, uh, there was no way I was going to get Daniel to think otherwise. So uh, uh, I'd like to, where is Daniel? Is he in the room right now? <laughs> Way back there. Raise your hand and say hi to everybody. Uh, as professors, we love to see students get excited about things, and certainly Daniel has so much enthusiasm for Dr. Wells coming that uh, you can see the results. We're glad that you're here. And uh, I'm going to stop talking now. I'd like to introduce Dr. Weil. That's fine. And uh, we do have uh, time for question and answers later on. Uh, we're going to speak for uh, a while on uh, two different topics, approximately an hour each. And then we'll have time for question and answers. That's so if you have questions true. during this first clear that. please write them down and reserve them yeah. for later. Dr. J. Weil, uh, now that I have to read, I'm going to... <laughs> read it correctly. J. J. Weil holds an earned PhD uh, from the University of Rochester in nuclear chemistry. He also did his undergraduate work there. He has won several awards for excellence in teaching. He's presented numerous lectures on the topics of nuclear chemistry, Christian apologetics, homeschooling, and creation, creation versus evolution. He's published more than 30 articles on these subjects in nationally recognized journals. And has nine books to his credit, including Reasonable Faith, The Scientific Case for Christianity. I also uh, would like to add to that that he's written a curriculum which uh, I use for uh, my uh, teenage daughter in the science. And uh, having taught science in the past, uh, I, I say that his work is exceptional and extraordinary. His teaching credentials include the University of Rochester, Indiana University, Ball State University, the Indiana Academy for Science, Mathematics, and Humanities. And uh, currently he owns Apologia Ministries, which is an ed educational uh, ministry. A company dedicated to giving people scientific reasons to believe in Christ. Their specialty is science curriculum for home educated students. Uh, again, I apologize for those of you standing or sitting, but thank you for coming anyway. Uh, there is food in the back somewhere provided by Christmas Crusade. <coughs> And uh, feel free to take part in that. And uh, with that said, I turn it over to Dr. Wall. Thank you, Dr. for coming. Thank you. So the question and answer session can be good. I'm actually going to just talk on one subject, then we'll open up to questions and answers. So that way you can ask about what I've just talked about. That'll make a little more sense. Uh, it's really unfortunate that we couldn't do a debate on this. I've done debates in the past, and I think academic pursuit is really based on debate. Uh, when I do nuclear chemistry, I have a set of data. I think it says something about how nuclei interact. I go to a convention, go to a conference, and other people with opposing views debate me on that. And that's how we learn about nuclear interactions. Unfortunately, there are some subjects that seem to be sac sacrosanct in the uh, 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 academic community, and you're not allowed to debate them. And that's unfortunate because what that does actually is that stymies academic progress. It stymies scientific progress. Scientific and academic progress are built on debate. It's unfortunate we couldn't do that. But nevertheless, I'll try and uh, uh, present uh, my arguments. The, uh, the subject at hand is the earth, is it young or is it old? And actually, I don't like the way this subject is framed at all because, in fact, it only gives two possibilities. The earth is young or old. Eh, it could be middle-aged, couldn't it? Uh, unfortunately, when you read about the Earth, uh, the Earth's age, typically you have people who think it's billions of years old or people who think it's thousands of years old and there's not much in between. Now the reason this is the case really is because most people are committed to some view of origins and that, commit, that, that uh, commitment requires them to believe something about the age of the Earth. Evolutionary naturalists 
have to have a billions of years old Earth. They can't have a millions, a hundreds of millions, or a thousands of years old Earth because evolutionary processes that are materialistic and naturalistic cannot operate that quickly. So if a person with that worldview sees some data that indicates the Earth is young, he's forced to put that in the pile of data he doesn't understand. Now that's fine, everybody has these piles of data. Uh, there's, you know, I'm sure you have some facts that seem inconsistent with your worldview. You put them in a little pile, you say hopefully we'll figure this out and we'll, you know, we'll make better sense of this later. However, the rational person has to continually look at those piles to make sure they're not getting too big. And as the piles get bigger and bigger, you need to start reevaluating your position. Now, of course, it's true on the other side as well. I have a lot of colleagues who are committed to the idea that the earth is very, very young because their interpretation of scripture demands that. When they see data that indicates the earth is old, they're forced to put that into the pile of things they don't understand. Now, either way, these folks are not really do looking at the uh, uh, question scientifically. If I want to look at the question, how old is the earth, from a strictly scientific point of view, I've got to drop my preconceptions so I can simply let the data speak for themselves. So that's what I'm asking you to do in this talk. I'm asking you to drop your preconceptions and just look at the data. At the end of the talk, if you want to go back to your preconceptions, that's fine. But at least look at the data for right now and see what the data say. Now obviously I'm not going to have a chance to talk about all of the data associated with the age of the Earth. I'm going to talk about the stuff that I think is most reasonable. And of course that automatically means that uh, I'm biasing the information I'm giving you. But please understand, we're tr I'm trying to, to uh, find a scientific reason, a scientific belief on the age of the Earth. Um, and so I'm trying to do that without a lot of preconceptions. In order to try and get you to uh, look at this a little more uh, in detail, uh, you can go to our website, which is Apologia.com, click on Handouts, and click on the, talk, on the title of this talk under the entry for Rochester, New York. It'll have all the words that are on the screen here, and it'll also have uh, references where you can go and learn more about these things if you want to. Because obviously, even for the data I'm going to discuss, I can't go into, into complete detail on everything. So hopefully if you go there, you can find other details. Now I was already given a fine introduction, so I'm just going to skip all that and go straight to how do we measure the age of something? If I want to know how old something, the Earth, anything else is, how do we measure the age? Well, think about an hourglass. The reason an hourglass allows us to measure time is once the hourglass has been sitting for a while, all the sand's there in the bottom, when I turn it over, the sand starts tr trickling down. Now I know the rate at which the sand trickles down. I know the bottom started off empty. And so if I know the initial condition, the bottom starting off empty, and I know the rate at which the sand trickles down, when I look at the sand at any given time, I could theoretically measure how long it's been since the hourglass has been overturned. That's what we have to do scientifically as well. We have to look at a process that has a constant rate. Uh, if we have a process that has a constant rate, we might be able to use that to measure the date of whatever is interesting. We need to obviously know that rate so we know how long things have been going on. We need to know the initial conditions. In case of the hourglass, the fact that the bottom was empty when it was first turned over. And you need an isolated system. I can't have sand leaking into or out of the hourglass. That's going to ruin the uh, hourglass. If I've got all four of these things, I can use them to date anything in which this process is occurring. And in fact, if you do a literature search, you can find 68 such processes throughout the natural world, at least, 68 of, that I've found in the literature, uh, that meet these conditions to one extent or another. Uh, some better than others. And in the end, they give ages for the Earth. And that date range goes from 100 years old, probably wrong, to 4.6 billion years old. And in fact, there doesn't seem to be a lot of, if anything, the grouping is right around tens of millions of years. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of um, um, you know, uh, trends. They just seem to be scattered all over the place. Now obviously, the Earth's been around for more than 100 years, so the, the uh, dating method that was used to get this result obviously has some problems with it. What we need to do when we look at dating methods to try and get how old the Earth is, we need to see how good that dating method meets all of these conditions. So with that in mind, let's talk about a few dating methods that have been used to look at the age of the 